Making It Work is brought to you by the Max Dupree Center for Leadership at Fuller Theological Seminary and the Theology of Work Project. Welcome to Making It Work. Through conversation, scripture, and stories, we invite God into work's biggest challenges so that you can live out your purpose in the workplace. I'm Mark Roberts. And I'm Leah Archibald. And this is Making It Work. heard that communication skills are essential to success in the workplace. You might have even worked on your communication skills before, whether it's practicing your delivery before a big presentation or beefing up your PowerPoint graphics. But there is one preliminary step to effective communication that is often overlooked in prep sessions, knowing your audience. Knowing your audience, understanding who they are and what makes them tick is so important that it can make the difference between a message that stirs people to action and a message that reaches nobody. So how can you find your audience? And once you find your audience, how can you tailor your communication strategy to strike a chord with them? Our guest, Patricia Raybon, is a professional journalist who's spoken to a wide variety of audiences. Throughout her career, she's published in magazines such as USA Today and Newsweek and delivered critically acclaimed works of nonfiction. But Patricia has recently learned to communicate in a new way with her first work of fiction, a murder mystery set in 1920s America. Her new book, All That Is Secret, was selected by Parade Magazine as a Mysteries We Love selection for fall 2021 and by Masterpiece on PBS among Best Mystery Books of 2021 as recommended by bestselling authors. With All That Is Secret, Patricia opens a new phase in her career that hinges on truly getting to know and understand her audience. Patricia Raybon, welcome to the Making It Work podcast. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here with you today. So we are just so delighted to pick your brain. And the first question that comes to mind is, what made you want to switch from writing nonfiction to writing fiction? Short answer. I love story and I wanted to learn how to write a story, a fictional story. That's the short answer. But And so I will... I'll share this backstory that um, I grew up on a pew, on a church pew. And so from a very young age, I was in a Sunday school room hearing the stories of the Bible, the um, the battle stories of the Old Testament with its heroes and sheroes, the, um, the miracles and the uh, parables of Jesus the and the acts of the apostles. And so uh, two things happened. I learned that there are stories. I learned that they matter because they were coming out of the Bible. I learned that, um, that Jesus teaches through story. And I learned to love them. But there's, you- um, and the, well, no, go ahead. I'm just going to say this other thing. There's one context in the in the context of this podcast. Um, I grew up with a family of people who work, mm. and both my mother and my father graduated from historically black universities when there was nowhere else for them to go. My dad was an accountant uh, by training worked for his entire career with the uh, U.S. Air Force Finance and Accounting Center here in Colorado. My mother was a, an elementary school phys ed teacher. These were working people. When, my, when I was a child and my feet hit the floor in the morning, the first thing we had to do was to make your bed. I still do that. And so I grew up learning how to work and um and then, and I grew up loving story. So when I had a third grade te- teacher ask me one day, uh, Patricia, would you like to be a writer when you grow up? I said, 
Yes. And she said, you are a writer. Mm -hmm. And so in the context of work, what she was saying is you are a writer and there is work connected to that. And so um, when it came to here recently deciding to write a novel, that said to me, do the work to learn how to do it. And um, because I grew up in a family of people who work, it became um, my latest work project, learning something that I love, which is story, learning how to write it. And so um, that's a long answer, but that's what's behind the decision to, to try it, to try, try to write a story. So Patricia, You've, you've said that part of your research in this book was figuring out exactly who your audience is. Who are you trying to communicate with? What did you need to learn about your audience? And how did you go about figuring that out, who your audience is for this book? Well, I knew that um, every book needs, every author and every book needs a specific audience to sell. So at some point, you know, writing becomes, after it's the creative work, it becomes um, the marketing work, the business work. And so at Tyndale House, which Tyndale produced or published my murder mystery, there was a a lot of discussion about the potential for uh, this mystery novel to have crossover appeal. But, um, I just had an awareness that I needed to pay attention to my core audience. Who was the core audience for this book? It would be sure it'd be great for it to have crossover appeal, but who's the core audience? And, um, and so that question took on special meaning when I decided to invest a little bit in um, targeted advertising for Facebook. Hmm. Yeah. And so that kind of investment it required me to specifically identify a particular audience of people. And I thought about it and I, I finally made myself, um, gave myself permission to say, the audience for this book are women over 45 who love Jesus and a good mystery. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that when I said that, I wasn't saying a word about crossover. I was talking about people like myself. And, um, and once I fell in love with the idea that um, this is an audience I know and I like, and I want to, um, honor by acknowledging them, then I was able to create the advertising that found them. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I created ads for women over 45. The ad says, um, for all that it's secret, the blurb says, Sherlock Holmes always needed a praying sister. Mm -hmm. And it says that because my lead character is um, African, a young African-American theologian. Mm. And in, the, um, in African-American culture, the word sister is an identifier. I think you're probably familiar with that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so there was, a, in those few words, um, s- some information that said this character who happens to be a fan of Sherlock Holmes. She's a theologian who uh, also loves Sherlock Holmes stories. And she's also struggling with her prayer life and, uh, and her God life. And so by acknowledging that I was writing a story with a faith character who also loves Sherlock Holmes, you know, I mean, it just cut through, uh, eliminated a lot of people who would not be interested in a mystery novel if if the character has a faith um, dilemma. 
And at the same time entices a lot of people who that would be, who that would enrich their leisure time experience of, of that too. Pre novel. So maybe, and so some of those people may have come along for the ride who, who ended up being, you know, in the um, crossover category. But the core audience was the one I was looking, I was trying to speak to first. I just ran a, an ad on Twitter. And uh, just because it's fun for me, it just I like trying it. And so I created an ad for that um, audience, my core audience. And it's a video showing a vintage chandelier, crystal chandelier. Because part of the story is my lead character, whose background is poor, ending up solving the murder by um, taking herself into an elite setting. Mm. And so the crystal chandeliers, it has a feminine aspect to it. And so uh, when I was looking at the analytics for that ad, you know, most of the people who responded to it are female. And, um, and then I used my faith language. And, and so it really helped me. It was, a, um, I, it was an epiphany for me that um, it, while an author wants everybody to read his or her book, a book is not for everybody. A ministry is probably not for everybody. Um, you know, a work agenda is not for everybody. So who is it for? And how can I best speak to those people first? I love and this. And I, you know, yes. well, I was just going to say, I'm not sure if I hadn't tried writing a novel, if I would ever spent any time really thinking about it that way. Yeah. Now, Mark, I want to hang out on this point a little bit because Patricia mm. just made the leap. You know, she said a book is not for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, even a ministry is not for everybody. And I wonder, you know, if the one communicator who probably touched more people than anyone else in the history of the human life, which is Jesus, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, had a kind of a core audience Mm -hmm. At the beginning. And That's Mark, right. I, Mark, I want to know what you, you know, do you think he, now he wasn't testing ads on Twitter one against another, <laughs> you know, doing his A-B testing. I mean, he had all the resources of, <laughs> you know, of God that he needed. Um, he could do, he could do those in the spirit level or whatever. No, I'm getting ahead of myself. But, but, <laughs> you know, Patricia or Mark, do you think yeah. uh, that he identified his core audience, you know, for his own specific reasons? Well, I mean, we know he did. And, yes. and one of the more, um, for some of us, troubling passages in the gospel, remember a woman comes to him and, and yes. he needs healing and he says, well, I've only, I've come for the lost of Israel. And we're right. like, wait a minute, Jesus, <laughs> you know, you're, you're like, <laughs> not going to serve this woman. And then he ends up, you know, serving her. But there was clarity there that was, mm -hmm. again, for us, that's kind of, of stunning. Now, ultimately, of course, Jesus for everyone, but for a season, and, and in, in that season of his, you know, physical life on earth, he was pretty focused there. I, and there are probably many other ways you could determine his focus, especially if you paid attention to, well, how did he communicate? And then you try to say, well, who are the people that are going to relate to those parables? Many about work and agriculture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, so it's pretty clear that Jesus was not really too much trying to reach the Roman centurions, though there was some interest in him from the Roman army. Occasionally. So he was open to the others. So, the, so there was the crossover possibility to put, to use uh, Patricia, your language. Yes. But he was pretty clear about what he was to do in that season of life. I mean, he didn't, for example, get on a ship and go to Rome. He could have done that. And right. he said, you know, hey, I'm I'm actually king of the world here. You know, I'm I'm the Lord. And he didn't do that. And and so it I, I think that can give us 
some permission or, or, or even more than permission. It, but I, I just, I laughed at Patricia because when I, I did my first book, you know, and the publisher wants to know who you're writing for. And, you know, very, it's like, well, I, I want to write for everybody. Yeah, you, know, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, who is this really for? And it, 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 initially it was very challenging to say, well, I guess I'm not really going to write for, you know, a, a, a people who are looking for something that I'm really not doing. And, and there's clarity in that. So I really, I appreciate your story. And you're right about the Facebook ads. I've done some of those. I mm-hmm. mean, you can just put it out there to whole Facebook, mm-hmm. but that's pretty silly. You can yes. actually do so many, you know, specifications. So I love it that you have thought, you know, that you're, you're, you're able to define your audience as you are and be open to the possibility that there are others. So for example, I don't quite fit into your, your audience since I'm not a woman. However, Mm -hmm. as a boy, I read almost every Nancy Drew book because I ran out of the Hardy Boys books. So, so there's sort of, and, and since then, I I also like mysteries. I, I actually, I love a good female protagonist. So I can be Mm -hmm. your crossover but you're right. You probably didn't write write that primarily for me, right? I I think um, I think you'll really like all that is secret, Mark, because it really moves. You know, it's a page turner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. In terms of it moving, <laughs> yeah. and um, and having excitement. Thank my husband for that. He <laughs> he said. Um, just keep it exciting, mm-hmm. and uh, and I we both love um, movies, and we love thriller movies and mystery movies. And so I understood mm-hmm. what he was saying. And so mm-hmm. when you get to those, there's a lot of those places in the in the book. So when you get to those places, say, Ah, Dan Raybon. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> That's great. But there are a lot of. Um, theological elements that are woven through this book as well. As you've mentioned, Patricia, your main character is a theologian, but who's also struggling with, you know, her belief and and her prayer life. And so even though the book is very fast paced, there's this theology that comes out naturally through the work of the characters, in this case, the work of solving a mystery. So you have a very real faith work interaction in this book. And I was, as I was reading, I was thinking, I wonder, Patricia, if this is something that you've seen to be true in your own life. So for me, I feel like my faith really comes alive when it gets tested in a work situation. You know, mm-hmm. I could I could have an idea of what I believe, but when I'm, you know, really tested or I got a tough decision or, you know, something's challenged me, the rubber meets the road, that's when I know when I really believe. And and that's kind of what's going on for these characters too, you know, caught up in this mystery. I wonder if that comes out of, you know, any work challenges you've had in your own life. Well, it comes out of that, but also it comes out of my life as a woman of color, um, having to navigate um, racism every day. And I I know that's hard for people who don't experience it to believe that that's the reality for people of color, but um, it is. Leaving leaving one's home means confronting um, bigotry Mm -hmm. every day for for the most part. And so in the case of this novel, it's set in the 1920s in Colorado when the state was ruled by the Ku Klux Klan. But Colorado, I don't know if you know this, had the second highest Klan membership per capita of any state in the nation in the 1920s. Every county in Colorado had a Klan clavern. And the leaders from the, from the governor on down were dues-paying members of the Klan, police chiefs, sheriffs, jury commissioners. And so having experienced... Um, having grown up, in my case, I age myself, but it's true, before the Civil Rights Act, before the Fair Housing Act and um, the Voting Rights Act, um, I wanted to explore 
a young woman's um, attempt to solve a crime while also having to navigate a world that devalued her. And um, and so in that way, the, the story does mirror my own personal experience. But because it's in another decade, you know, in the 1920s, I could, um, you know, not make it a contemporary um, exploration of race and faith, but give uh, provide enough as historical distance to allow the story to be fun to read, even though she had this big challenge. And um, and so I, people have thanked me for that. And I was going to share with you, I got a note from the CEO of <laughs> Tyndale the, uh, about a week and a half ago. He sent it through my publisher there saying how much he, he said, I, Patricia, I thoroughly enjoyed reading All That Is Secret. I uh, read it almost in one sitting. You pulled me through the story with the fascinating characters and so on. And with the tension experienced by the black characters and community living alongside a white majority culture. And I appreciated uh, Amelie, that's my lead character. I appreciate her struggle and her understanding of where God fit until these complications of her life. And I appreciate his feedback so much because he, un- he um, grasped exactly what I was attempting to do, which is to share uh, this, this young woman's struggle and challenges because of her race while also trying to solve a crime. Because, you know, that's the thing about, um, for a person of color, in terms of work, you still have to, after dealing with that kind of atmosphere in a lot of workplaces, you still have to go home and figure out what's for dinner. And how, I, you know, am I going to, why, how am my husband and I going to solve this argument that we're having? Or how am I, um, or theologically, how am I going to um, work as unto the Lord when I have a supervisor who won't give me the time of day. And so um, those are um, interesting questions for me, personally and theologically. And I wanted to put them into a story because I'm, I'm aware, I became aware that people who would not read a nonfiction reflection on that that I had written would read an entire novel. Hmm. Yeah. So what is your hope that readers would take away? You know, I mean, I, I love this comment from the CEO of Tinsdale of, of how he really got the sense of what God um, meant for you or for your lead character in the midst of these struggles. What, do you actually, is there a specific message that you hope readers would get about God's presence in the midst of that struggle? That, that, that is the message. That the, the takeaway is that God keeps us anyway. And, um, and so while my character never says that in those many words, that's the message of the story. And that's what I hope readers come away f- with. Understand that no matter our struggle, mine particularly is because of my age and uh, background, very often intersects with race and faith. But people have all kinds of different challenges. But no matter what, our God is a keeping God. And, um, and so my, my character, who's um, come from some, uh, you know, pretty, um, oh, challenging background, by the end of the book, we'll have come to understand that. And so that's the, that is the takeaway that I hope readers get to. In some ways, I'm just so 
grateful that you address these questions in the genre of a mystery. Mm -hmm. Because it is kind of a mystery. Yes. (laughs) Or at least it's a mystery. It's a mystery to me that, as you say, God is a keeping God. You know, why God would want to continue to, um, to search for us and find us, you know, amidst all the troubles in the world. You know, that is, that is a mystery, you know, and that is an action story. So in many mm-hmm. ways, it seems like a very appropriate genre to address these questions. Mark, what do you think? Well, I, I mean, partly, Patricia, I just think you're, you're, you're giving a great gift to your readers especially your readers who aren't black, who, who, who wouldn't mm-hmm. understand many things. One of the, the great powers of fiction writing is, is the ability to invite people into the experience of others and, and you know, to grow in understanding. And, you know, it, it just, uh, that's really important. And, and, you know, so for you to write out of your experience and, you, you know, you, you could very well write a an autobiography or other things, and maybe you will do that. But to be able to put it into fiction is, is just a, a way to draw people in. Uh, you know, good fiction has that power to expand our, our minds and our hearts, and somehow in ways that, that uh, nonfiction is maybe less able to do, except, of course, a powerful biography or something like that. But I just think it, it, uh, it I, I mean... And even in my own life, I mean, I think of reading, say, uh, Oh, Beloved uh, by Toni Morrison. I mean, that was a, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, that's not my world, but I could enter into that world. And that was yes. a huge gift. So the fact that you're doing this, and then it's also something that is obviously meant to be fun and intriguing. And it, it, it's just, um, there's, a, there's a complexity in what you're doing that is really quite, amazing and wonderful. And, but again, for the gift you're giving, that's really great. When I think about it, I, my only regret is that I didn't turn to fiction writing a lot sooner because I've always loved Mm -hmm. novels. There's a, a film doctor named Robert McKee who's written a book called Story, which is about, um, it's really for screenwriters. It's, but it's about cinematic writing but he says what you just said, and that he says it this way, that we don't go to story to escape life, but to find life. Mm. And um, as I reread his book before working on mine, I gained um, an appreciation for the opportunity to use a story to um, help people go, as you say, to places and situations that they ordinarily would not mm-hmm. and would not have to. But if they go there, there'll be a lesson waiting. And of course, the mo- our model for that is Jesus teaching through the parables. Yes. You know, there was a certain man who had two sons. As soon as yeah. we hear that, you know, our, we just our radars go straight crazy up because we recognize it as a story. This is a story Mm -hmm. and stories teach things. That's great. And, uh, and so I, uh, I just love that about it. And I've loved that. I was telling my, my granddaughter, I have a, my 13, a five grandchildren. One of them is 13 and she just finished reading Dune Mm. (laughs) and, uh, And so I was saying to her, isn't it interesting how the writer is in the process of writing learns lessons as well. And so I love what my things, some of the things that my lead character taught me Mm. that I wouldn't have thought about otherwise. Oh, that's wonderful. Hey, say, by the way, I mean, you mentioned wishing you had started earlier, but it, 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 it seems that this is not the end of your fiction writing. You, you're rather promising that this is a series, right? Right. And boy, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I um, you know, I, I finished with God's help, the manuscript for the book. My agent uh, sold it to Tyndale. And, um, and then 
well, they, Tyndale came back and said, we want this and we're making a three book offer mm. because uh, re- mis- readers love series, mystery yeah. readers love series. And so, um, and so in fact, I finished again with God's help, book two, we're editing book two now. Mm. Mm. And, um, and that was the first thing people, I, people would say, oh, I really like, I really love this book. When's the next one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's true, though, so, in mystery uh, writing. Uh, you know, I, the, the yes. ones I've read, you know, it, it, it uh, so, well, I, I'm, I'm glad, and it, you're well into the next one, so that's awesome. Yes, so I'm very grateful for that. It's humbling work. I um, am daily humbled by uh, the invitation to sit down with the Lord and uh, think about the world that he is inviting me to create and share with people. Mm-hmm. And I'm so grateful that they're interested in our reading it and are asking for more. Mm-hmm. What a, I think we'll close on that note because just what a wonderful way to describe the blessings of doing work with God, yes. you know, and if we have people in our audience thinking about their work and who they communicate with, you know, what a um, beautiful example of working with God to communicate to the audience who really is standing there waiting to hear what you have to say. So Patricia Raybon, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. It's really been a pleasure. Yes. Indeed. Thank you for having me. That's our show. Don't miss the next episode. Be sure to subscribe. And if you like what you've heard, please leave a review. We'd love to hear from you. And it helps other people find us. Thanks for listening.